had a lecture called uh, Science Graphics, What, Why, When, and How. Uh, this lecture is sponsored by the William Pearson Field Lectures at the Keller Center, which is within the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Uh, my name is Sheila Pontis. I'm part of the faculty of the Keller Center. Um, and I'm just really, really happy to introduce today to Jennifer Christensen, uh, who is the Senior Graphics Editor of Scientific American, uh, where she arts directs and produces illustrated information graphics and data visualizations. So her, join me to welcome here, uh, Jen. <laughs> Um, thanks so much for that introduction, Sheila. And thanks for hosting me here at Princeton. As Sheila mentioned, I'm here to talk about science graphics. What are they? Why are they useful? When, when should you produce them? And how are they made? That's a lot to cover, um, so I should probably start by defining my edges. More specifically, I'll be answering those questions as they pertain to my duties as a graphics editor at Scientific American Magazine. Then I'll provide some practical tips and resources. So I'll be providing some practical tips and resources for scientists who want to improve their own graphics um, for both communicating their research to their peers and to broader audiences. That part is critical. My discussion revolves around graphics designed to communicate information to an audience, not visualizations that are tools for data analysis. My primary take home message being that regardless of your target audience, science graphics should be developed thoughtfully. The goal of the graphic should be established early on and design decisions should be made to support that goal. First, for context, here's a little bit about Scientific American and my personal background. Scientific American is the oldest continuously printed magazine in the United States. It was founded in 1845 as a four-page weekly devoted primarily to inventions. The magazine was founded in 1845, and in the late 1850s, astronomy, chemistry, agriculture, applied physics, and medical topics began to appear. In 1921, the scope broadened further. It shifted from an inventor's paper to a monthly periodical of popular science. In May 1948, things changed again with a dramatic shift in tone and aesthetics. The editors insisted that many of the articles be written by the people that actually did the work described, kicking off a tradition of scientist authors. An online version of the magazine appeared on AOL in 1994, and the English language website was launched in 1996. This is how it appears now. The most recent print redesign was in 2010, and our tablet edition for the iPad was launched in 2012 followed by a continuous evolution and refining of our digital magazine designs for computer, tablet, and mobile phone viewing. Our first international edition was based in Italy, followed by 14 others. Most recently, a freely accessible online version for the Arabic-speaking world. The international partners have access to our original content, but also develop um, articles specifically for their own audiences, so it's not a page-for-page -page direct translation. As the editors in 1910 put it, it has been the constant aim of this journal to impress the fact that science is not inherently dull, heavy, or abstruse, but that it is essentially fascinating, understandable, and full of undeniable charm. And here's some background for context on what has shaped my personal point of view. I self-define as a graphics editor and a science communicator. I was trained primarily in traditional or physical media pencils, pens, and paint. Here's one of my first published scientific illustrations. It's ink drawings of hydrothermal vent shrimp mouthparts. It's one of the products of a few summers in college working in a crustacea lab at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. I did get a chance to dabble in the digital realm starting in the late 1980s with a Commodore Amiga, thanks to my high school art teacher, Robert Tarter. I then shifted over to tablets and virtual drawing at Smith College where my instructor, Gary Niswanger, led a standard drawing course, substituting charcoal and paper with a computer. The class focused on drawing principles and ideas that transcended drawing tools. Suffice to say that there were no tutorials. 
we simply explored the software as needed to solve the illustration problems as we encountered them. Sadly, but perhaps not surprisingly, I don't have clear examples of my earliest digital work. And if I did, it would be hard to access them um, since we've gone through several generations of disk storage types since then. I was able to track this photo down in a college print publication. Um, I find it pretty telling that one of the few artifacts of my early digital work is a photo of an image on a screen printed on paper. You might notice that the subject of my illustration here is a conch shell. I can't recall the species, um, but I do recall taking reference photographs in a geology field course. As much as I loved my art and design classes, I also loved my science classes. I resisted choosing one discipline at the expense of the other and pursued a double major in geology and studio art. Then a scientific illustration graduate program at the University of California, Santa Cruz caught my eye and allowed me to officially merge the two disciplines under the tutelage of Anne Caudill, Jenny Keller, and Larry Lavendel. Instead of dedicating myself to a single scientific line of research, I'd help make other people's research accessible to wider audiences through a visual language. That program is now hosted by California State University at Monterey Bay. At first, to me, that meant observation and representation, and I developed illustrations in the spirit of these examples by Robert Hooke and Maria Sibylla Mirian. But over time, my interest shifted from illustrating objects to illustrating processes and explanatory concept diagrams, more in the spirit of this moon phase diagram by Al Biruni. And I shifted more and more towards trying to show things like change over time, as in this series that shows the feeding behavior of monarch butterfly caterpillars. My interest shifted from object representation to process representation. I entered the publishing scene after graduate school as an intern at the art department at Scientific American, thanks to my mentor, Ed Bell. This is my first illustration for the magazine, a watercolor cockroach. My internship turned into a full-time job, and as my role shifted from artist to art director, I found myself setting my watercolors and pens aside and turning to the computer as my primary tool. In 1998, I left Scientific American to work as an assistant art director and then a designer at National Geographic, all the while growing as an art director and learning about print production by some of the best in the business. Then I established a freelance science communication business focusing mainly on magazine and book projects. In 2007, I returned to Scientific American where I'm now the senior graphics editor. Today, there are two of us on the graphics team, Amanda Montanez and me. We art direct all of the information graphics in the magazine from data visualizations, like the example on the left by Pitch Interactive, to illustrated explainers, like the sample on the right by Sherry Sinan. Occasionally, we develop the final images ourselves, but most often we hire freelance artists and manage the project. We also manage digital versions of all the graphics for web and phone viewing, and Amanda develops graphics specifically for the web environment. Editorial illustrations like these examples by Maria Corde Madigan and Jay Bent are art directed by other people in the art department. What's the difference? Well, by my definition, information graphics are illustrations that are built on a foundation of research that exist primarily to convey information whereas editorial illustrations are thematic illustrations that are inspired by the text and entice readers to engage more fully with the magazine's content. For example, for an article on the microbiome, illustrator Brian Christie developed an opening image that is not a literal representation of the concept, but instead nods to the idea of a human as being defined by the microbes within. Brian is telling a story with visual symbols and thoughtful composition, but this is not an information graphic. Instead, it's a metaphorical illustration that nods to a theme in the text. Within the article, Brian and his collaborator, Joe Lertola, shift into information graphics mode, using visual symbols and thoughtful composition to convey very specific information that is rooted in research. This is not an editorial illustration. It's an information graphic or an explanatory diagram.
some artists, like Brian Christie, are comfortable in both of these worlds. But this is where I reside when it comes to my own illustration work and in my role as a graphics editor. To reiterate, by my definition, information graphics are illustrations built on a foundation of research that exist primarily to convey information. I tend to think of information graphics as a continuum with figurative representations at one end and abstract representations at the other. In the world of science visualization, you could argue that the full continuum can also be refined to, referred to as data visualizations. After all, essentially all of the work being depicted is based on data collection at some stage of the process. From bone length measurements in dinosaur reconstructions, to meticulously documented laboratory experiments that build up to more complete understanding of things like photosynthesis, to representations of mathematical expressions like Feynman diagrams, and straight up plotting of the raw data itself in chart form. But this may be a more widely accepted and useful way of categorizing things. Representative illustrations, explanatory diagrams, and data visualizations, all under the umbrella of information graphics. Here are a few examples of graphics from the magazine to give you a better sense of what I mean by each of those general categories. Here, a central, now extinct bird is illustrated alongside other birds for a sense of scale and overall anatomy. But this graphic doesn't really attempt to explain a lot more beyond that. It simply presents objects to the reader for comparison, guided by the captions. It's a representative illustration. And here, artist Don Foley simply portrays the rover Curiosity so that we can label out the various scientific instruments. It's a clear and literal depiction of an object. In an explanatory diagram, the artist often starts to rely on symbols and non-realistic color to add layers of meaning. For example, in this graphic on changes in climate, artist Emily Cooper uses arrows and non-realistic colors to help the reader see and understand the invisible forces at play. And in this example, artist Bungie Tagawa distorts the physical form of his subject to best serve the informational content. This is a variation on a classic schematic representation of the cardiovascular system. Rather than get caught up in the details of a human figure, the information is streamlined in a way that highlights the closed and circular flow of blood through the system. Data visualization pushes things even further towards the abstract. Values are represented in forms ranging from straightforward and familiar line charts like this to more novel and bespoke forms, like this chart set on birth times by Zan Armstrong and Nadi Bremer. With that background information in hand, let's move on to part two, why and how we produce information graphics at Scientific American. For the remainder of this talk, I'll also refer to information graphics more succinctly as graphics. Broadly speaking, there are two reasons for visualizing scientific content, analysis and communication. At Scientific American, we're generally in the business of science communication. More specifically, we specialize in making advances in science and technology accessible with the goal of engaging, informing, and inspiring a non-specialist audience. That includes developing illustrated explanatory diagrams and data visualizations that both explain the re latest research findings in depth and place those findings in context of a larger research arc. That may sound straightforward, um, but many newsworthy topics in science stand on a foundation of lots of incremental research findings, most of which we can't assume that our readers already know. Consider, for example, the topic of a 2015 article in Scientific American on the Ebola virus. On the heels of a major outbreak in West Africa, author Helen Branswell wrote about a few emerging experimental treatments and potential vaccines, and how the scale of that outbreak made those advances possible. 
The goals of the graphic for that article were to, one, show why the Ebola virus is so deadly, and two, highlight the two stages of the disease that are targets for treatment. I started by inviting the reader in and defining the focus of the graphic with a straightforward illustration of the virus, setting up the scene and nodding to why readers should care with the introductory text. Then folks dive into the microscopic world of a human world of a human infected with Ebola to see how the virus is thought to hijack the immune system and compromise the circulatory system, leading to organ failure. But in order to understand how the virus messes things up, the reader needs to know what the normal state is and how the immune system generally works. And they need to be properly introduced to the other cells that they'll encounter along the way. All the while, the illustration needs to remain focused on the crux of this particular story, Ebola, without that main story getting lost in a sea of too much other context. In this case, I aimed to keep Ebola as the focus by having the reader track the virus, painted red, across the page through time. The timeline became the spine of the spread. Human cells in gray were introduced as they became relevant in the virus's timeline. Then two key components, major points in the main text, were highlighted in yellow. Isolating those two points in yellow circles reinforced the hierarchy of the information. Context as background, critical new details as overlay. When developing graphics like these, background research and consulting with research scientists is key. Over the years, I've developed a few strategies for illustrating technical topics for broad audiences on deadline. What follows is an idealized version of my process for working on graphics that are rooted in cutting edge research. Stage one, establish the basic goal of the graphic. In general, at Scientific American, text manuscripts take the lead. Upon reading the preliminary manuscript draft, I identify which concepts I think would be best served with an illustration as opposed to text. My leading question is, would a graphic be useful in helping to convey this information? But when are graphics useful? Well, to my mind, they're useful when images can tell the story more efficiently, effectively, or completely than words. Like the iconic Feynman diagram in which a visual can stand in for a more abstract formula or when the narrative involves complex and intertwining relationships, and an image map can help the reader track connections, like a process diagram that explains the intricacies of photosynthesis. Or when the reader might benefit from seeing and exploring trends and patterns of the complete data set, rather than being served up a few key numbers in the text or when a direct and immediate visual comparison is useful in highlighting change or differences between states, such as competing hypotheses or before and after views. After I identify potential graphics topics, I confer with my colleagues to make sure we're in agreement and to confirm that the intended text and image paths haven't diverged. Stage two, research. Whenever possible, I begin with a primary source, ideally a key journal paper or, or a review that describes the latest research. Then I expand out from there, starting with papers that catch my eye in the primary paper's citations and basic searches on the lead scientists and their collaborators. Then I move on to the bigger picture. How does this latest finding fit into other research in the area? More often than not, I need to do some really basic searches on core concepts to make sure that I'm not wildly misinterpreting things and that I have a basic understanding of the key terminology. Keyword-driven Google image searches help me quickly sort out what other graphics have already been completed on the topic and often help me to identify weaknesses or holes in the broader coverage helping to focus my line of thought on how we can add something new to the conversation. Stage three, concept sketch development. Now it's time to put that research to use and translate my notes and doodles into a cohesive sketch. 
I began with articulating what exactly the graphic aims to explain, starting with the wide view. Am I comparing and contrasting competing hypotheses? Two panels side by side might make sense. Showing change over time? A linear or cyclical step-by-step -step approach might be useful. Showing how something works? The physicality of the subject itself might inform the layout. Once I've spent some time thinking through the basic form, I'll develop a rough layout. These sorts of illustrations don't live in a vacuum. They exist on a page or a screen, and they have titles, captions, and labels. I find that thinking through all of those pieces from the very start really forces clarity of intention. And I'll even dra draft straightforward and descriptive headlines and subheads that it, so I can better articulate my intentions to the rest of the article team. All the while, I'm thinking in terms of centering the new research finding and supporting that new information with broader context. Stage four, concept sketch review. Once I'm happy with the concept sketch, I seek feedback from colleagues to make sure that the preliminary plans for the text and graphic are still cohesive and complementary. Then the concept sketch gets sent out to the author or research scientist for review. In some cases, I'll need to loop back around to stage three if my initial interpretations don't pass muster with the content experts. If this is needed, I'll ask the consultant for more reference material to help guide the revised plan. Stage five, tight sketch development. If the concept sketch is approved, the next stage is all about folding in specific notes and change requests into a tight sketch. At this point, I sharpen the illustrative details and flesh out the labels, and the text editor starts in on writing captions. Stage six, tight sketch review. Once I'm happy with the tight sketch, I send it out for another review. Feedback loops that focus in on specific details of the illustration are fine at this stage, but the composition and overall plan should be locked in at this point. If there was a fundamental problem with the content, and therefore a fundamental problem with the composition, it should have been flagged earlier. Stage seven, the final graphic. Once the technical details are all in place, the final rendering is fleshed out. And stage eight is final graphic review. The final rendering is sent around for a last look by colleagues, including a copy editor and a fact checker and the expert consultant to ensure that no, no errors were introduced at the final rendering stage and that the details are sound. By working through these stages with lots of thought put into the structure of the diagram before the details come into focus and sketches that are organized to reflect the core concept being explained, I find that I'm forced to really think through the content before getting distracted by drawing details. If the organization of the graphic is solid, then the illustrative details can develop organically within that framework. In the spirit of an anatomical artist, I try to get the bones organized properly before fleshing things out. In this case, the final rendering is still pretty simple, but in cases in which the final is illustration is really complex or time consuming to execute, like complicated three-dimensional renderings or traditional paintings, Organization clarity early on is also a really important time and money saver. Let's take a look at a few concrete examples from start to end. For an article on greening disease in citrus trees by journalist Anna Kuchman, I started by reading the unedited preliminary text manuscript. As I read through, I find myself underlining portions, trying to connect the various elements. It seemed to me that including a graphic that provided a visual overview of the problem would be a useful addition to the article. As in every case, I started by doing a bit of my own preliminary research so that I could get a better handle on the jargon and what's already been published on the topic. Sometimes that's just a few hours of web-based research to familiarize myself with the topic beyond the text manuscript. In this case, I soaked up as much as I could about the pathogen, the insects that spread it, and its impact on orange trees. 
I began to put the pieces together in a really rough cartoon to establish the main points and to sort out how these main points might be organized on the page. Then I started to refine things a bit. Starting with the introductory caption in the top left corner, the reader would then move down to the insect life cycle and a note, then over to the bacteria details and down to the effects on the orange tree. The author pointed out that we could also incorporate a possible solution to the problem, a predator that could potentially wipe out the vector insect. At this stage, you can see that I'm not concerned with details. I'm thinking broad strokes, main points, and the flow of the story. That includes thinking out caption needs, how many notes are needed, and where. The next round is still pretty rough, but the details are starting to come into focus a bit. The previous round was more about making decisions on the overall structure of the box. This round is cleaner so that I can more effectively communicate to the artist my hopes for the final art. If the concept is really abstract or complicated, I'll often send this sort of concept sketch out for expert review. But in this case, I thought it was safe to bring in a freelance artist in first to tighten up the sketch before the first review. I sent freelance illustrator Sherry Sinan my concept sketch and a research packet. She returned this tight sketch. Here are those two sketches side by side, so you can see how the correct leaf and insect forms are now coming into focus. Our expert consultant, Philip Anzulet Stansley, an entomologist then at the University of Florida, did a really thorough review and returned a marked up PDF. I went through the notes, clarified some points and overruled a few others, and added some more visual references and passed along the notes to the artist. Here's the final art box. As noted before, once I get artists and expert consultants involved, I usually aim for a three-step process like this. Concept sketch, tight sketch, final art. Often there can be some feedback loops that focus in on specific details, but their overall structure should lock in as soon as possible. Here's another example, this time with a scientist author, two of them actually, physicists Bogdan Dobresko and Don Lincoln. Working with scientist authors really streamlines the process for me um, since I have a direct line to an expert and they have a vested interest. I started with the unedited text manuscript and a conversation with my text editing colleague, Clara Moskowitz. The authors study particle interactions and dark matter. This article would describe some recent ideas and experiments related to the idea that dark matter might, in fact, be a range of different particle and force types that just don't interact very much with what we think of as normal matter. Here are some of the references that the authors provided that speak to some of the particles behaviors and forces that they describe. Now, some of our readers would be very comfortable with jumping straight into discussions of unconventional dark matter, but for non-specialist readers, I wanted to provide some more context. So I started mapping out the different types of dark matter particles that have been proposed and how each of those types relate to each other. This would allow us to present some really basic definitions, um, but in a form that would be more useful and interesting than just a basic glossary. Then I took those notes and started to build things into a magazine layout. The main circle here holds the different dark matter candidates and their relationships to one another. Then on the right, we dive further into information related to the crux of the article. That piece is directly related to the author's reference material. After confirming with the editor and authors that the basic plan was sound, I started refining that plan. Here's the tight sketch. Then I sent that version out for review. The authors sent back a lot of notes like this one related to both the words and imagery on the page. Here's a very close to final version. Still a few details are to be sorted out, but it was ready for my fact-checking colleague to review. The fact-checker goes through and makes sure that our terms and stated facts check out with other authoritative sources. 
These are the fact checker notes for that graphic. Some of them, there are more. And here's the final version as it printed in the magazine. Here's the overview of the full progression. As you can see, I'm not too worried about setting up the final aesthetic in the early stages. I'm really just trying to pin down the best way to organize the information. Then once that content settles in, the color palette and style details can be fleshed out. So far, I've been speaking about the grand arc of graphics production at Scientific American, but I haven't really gotten into some of the basic design decisions that shape things. I think it makes sense to fold those into part three, practical tips for scientists who are looking to improve their own graphics. Before I dive in, I'd like to share this web address. Um, it leads to an evolving Google Sheet of resources that I maintain in response to specific requests from students, scientists, and artists interested in learning more about scientific visualization um, from illustration to data visualization and the work that I do as a graphics editor. And at this URL, there's a uh, spreadsheet that includes the specific resources that I'll mention in the rest of this talk. I'll pop those up at the end of the talk too. As I noted earlier, the first step in developing a graphic to communicate scientific content to an audience is to establish the goal of the graphic. What story or bit of content are you trying to explain or convey in visual form? What's your point? As a scientist, this is where your expertise lies. You are a content expert, so cash in on that and very carefully think through this part. When establishing the goal, you should also think about the ultimate context. Who's your audience? And how will they be consuming the graphic? Then keep the answers to those questions in mind as you make design decisions. But how do you make design decisions? I think this is where some of you, maybe as scientists, might start to get a little less comfortable, in part because I think that many of us have come to think of illustration and design as intuitive fields. But when it comes to information design, we can and should lean heavily on the field of perception science and best practices that have emerged from that field, particularly design decisions that are related to organization and clarity. Momentarily, I'll introduce you to some top level best practices, but if you want more details, here are some great resources. I think it's fair to say that uh, most of the broadly accessible resources on best practices in visualization design are focused on data visualization. Um, here are some great books. And some other sources, including the Data Stories podcast for interviews with visualization researchers. Robert Kosara's blog, Eager Eyes, for leads on where else to look. Um, and I love this one from Kennedy Elliott. It's a post entitled, 39 Studies About Human Perception in 30 Minutes. As well as Multiple Views, it's a Visualization Research Explained blog, and the Nature Methods column, Points of View. My top pick for an overview of developing information graphics that includes diagrams and schematics as well as information uh, as well as data visualizations. Um, it also has a solid foundation in perception science is Alberto Cairo's The Functional Art. Also um, for science centric explanatory diagrams and schematics, I recommend the Spark online class by Tammy Tolpa and Betsy Pillay. Again, those resources and more information can be found here. Let's return to step one, establishing the goal of your graphic, keeping your audience and your outlet in mind. Here's a figure published by Carla Reyes-Gill, Joshua Spurgeon, and Nathan Lewis. It's a schematic of a material that their lab developed to mimic photosynthesis. This image is perfectly serviceable in the context of a scientific paper. The goal is clear. Show the components of the nanostructure and provide a basic sense of how it works. Color is used intentionally to represent different material types, labels are legible, and the schematic isn't overwhelming. It's not trying to accomplish too much in the space allotted. 
It's a great example of a solid figure designed for the author's peers in an academic paper. But when you change the audience and the outlet, you also subtly shift that goal of the graphic. For example, when presenting this same basic content to a non-specialist audience, I needed to not only engage non-specialist readers, but also help them more immediately see the parallels between this technology and natural photosynthesis. In an effort to make the parallels as explicit as possible, I started by drawing out the steps using the same composition for each approach. Natural photosynthesis at the top, artificial at the bottom. Then used color to help highlight which parts correspond. But stacking things on top of each other meant that the reader's eye would have to bounce from top to bottom, searching for the corresponding steps. So I pulled things apart and put them next to each other, leaving room for explanatory text between the two approaches. Here's the final art box as rendered by botanical artist Sherry Sinan. The goal was to invite the reader in with a warm and welcoming aesthetic, keep them engaged with some basic primer information about photosynthesis that would likely feel a little bit familiar, then have the reader build on that more familiar content by showing how the new technology works. This approach is probably not the best solution for a research paper with an expert audience. But for a consumer magazine with a more generalist audience, we have a freedom to go a little bit playful with the rendering style and a responsibility to provide the tools and information that a generalist reader needs in order to really understand the new science being presented. That's why there's not one perfect design solution for each content scenario. You need to think about the people that you're developing the graphic for and how they'll encounter it. For more on this idea, I highly recommend the post Design for an Audience by Jonathan Coram, a science graphics editor at the New York Times. Let's move on to some more concrete best practice tips, starting with how to organize your information. Basically, how to choose a form or how to place objects on a page in a way that reinforces your main point. There are lots of tools to help you sort this out when it comes to quantitative information. Um, here's one by Jonathan Schwabish and Severino Rebecca. And Stephanie Evergreen's book is organized by this principle. Different chart forms are appropriate for highlighting different kinds of relationships. For example, line charts are great for tracking changes over time. Histograms or bar charts are suited for comparing discrete categories. But things get a little more nebulous when organizing qualitative information on a page. That said, here are some helpful guidelines. Think about taking a reader by the hand and walking them through your graphic, one step at a time. What information do they need to encounter first in order to understand the rest of the figure? What information should they encounter second? How can you help the reader follow the correct path effortlessly on their own if you aren't there to walk them through it? Western readers have been trained to start at the top left corner of pages and will tend to read from left to right and top to bottom. I'll often start with that flow in mind but also provide a clear path for a reader to follow. If a reader doesn't need to put too much energy into trying to figure out how to walk through your, your graphic, there's more energy to dedicate to absorbing the content itself. That approach works particularly well when showing a step-by-step -step process like this one. And it's a good default position. But you can also use the position of objects on a page to help highlight second level points you're trying to make. For example, if the process is cyclical, reinforce it with a cyclical composition, like this. When comparing and contrasting variations on the same process, it can be useful to keep the composition of each scenario exactly the same and aligned. When the objects are aligned this way, you've set up the reader to more quickly spot the differences between the two scenarios. Here, I've helped further by literally highlighting the two critical differences in yellow.
Here's another example in which two competing hypotheses are presented side by side. By setting things up side by side, similarities and differences are pretty quickly apparent. Let's move on to some best practice tips related to clarity. This example is courtesy of Robert Simon, a data visualization engineer with Planet Labs, who wrote a blog post for the Scientific American website using an example rooted in sea surface temperature. You can read the full post at the URL shown here. His core example is a data visualization, uh, but these ideas also um, can be transferred to information graphics. Despite being relatively simple, one variable changing over time, the data is difficult to read in this original chart by NASA's Scientific Visualization Studio. Robert improved on it by creating visual hierarchy with subtle changes in typography, color, and arrangement. Here's the redesign chart. As he wrote in the blog post, quote, a visual hierarchy brings the most important elements of a graphic into the foreground and pushes less important elements into the background. A strong layout will also guide the eye so that a viewer will see information necessary to understand a graphic. This is exactly like the front page of a newspaper. The most important headlines are emphasized strongly, followed by less important stories, body text, and bylines. Readers get the overall point quickly and are able to absorb the supporting details with further study. So what did Robert change in order to shift attention from the chart architecture to the data itself? He removed the frame around the graph entirely. It flattens the graphic, lessening the difference between the foreground and the background. He adjusted the red, neutral, and blue colors so that they'd have more equal visual weight. In the original, the white central zone was dominant and pops out. In the revised version, the red and blue tones don't fade into the background. He removed intermediate tick marks and some labels, making the remaining labels easier to read, and shifted some labels off to the side of the chart. You'll note that those were all really subtle design tweaks. The chart form remained intact because a line chart is a great way to show change over time. His adjustments are all related to clarity and improved legibility. Color can be tricky. Not only do you need to be cognizant of the fact that some of your readers may be colorblind, but also color gradients can be misleading when used to represent quantitative ranges. So I follow a few strategies when dealing with color. Admittedly, I'm not a good, as good about doing this as I'd like to be or I should be, um, but when possible, I try to provide other cues as well, such as directly connecting labels to colorized lines, as in this example. And although I often use color to emphasize and clarify certain paths or relationships, I try to make sure that the graphic holds up even when color is removed. For example, in this example that I shared earlier, Color reinforces the different cell types, and yellow highlights draw attention to a few key captions. But if I strip the color out, the content still holds up. The different cell types are represented by different colors, but they're also different sizes, shapes, and or tones. But double encoding isn't always possible, especially when trying to represent continuous data. Sadly, scientists often default to the beautiful but flawed full color rainbow spectrum. Here's a great example compiled by Fabio Crameri that demonstrates its primary flaw. The full color spectrum rate gradient adds artificial strong boundaries to data, one at the yellow and red transition and another at the blue cyan traditions, transition. These artificial boundaries are even evident when you strip out the color and view the gradient in grayscale. So how do you solve this problem? Use a more suitable gradient, not the full color spectrum like this one. When in doubt, print things out on a grayscale printer 
or simply change the digital color profile to grayscale for a quick reality check. If you're seeing artificial patterns in your data, or if you've lost key distinctions in your graphic, change your color palette. There are a lot of great resources on color out there, including palette guides. I highly recommend um, checking out Robert Simon's series, Subtleties of Color, and the research of Karen Schloss. Let's move on to typography. Always keep hierarchy and legibility top of mind when working with text. When choosing fonts, keep it simple and straightforward. It's much better to choose one typeface and thoughtfully create a hierarchy with font size, weight, and position than to get caught up in experimenting with many different typefaces in a single figure, figure poster, or presentation. When it comes to labels, aim to align your text boxes when possible and keep leader lines consistent by limiting yourself to just a few angles. This keeps things clean and ordered and limits visual noise. When it comes to setting full paragraphs for things like posters, keep column, column widths narrow. Shorter lines are easier to read than long ones. And if your lines are too long, the reader will lose track of their progress vertically as they read through a full paragraph. This has more to do with the number of letters per line than a specific column size, um, since it's also dependent on font size. So aim for average line lengths of 45 to 90 letters. For a great, concise, and well-indexed source for more details, check out Butterick's Practical Typography. For a deeper dive, check out Thinking with Type by Ellen Lupton. Those tips on composition, color, and type apply to all contexts. But I'd like to leave you with a few tips related to customizing technical graphics for a non-specialized audience. This chart was provided by, as reference material for a Scientific American article on the rings of Saturn. The top chart shows a dis how a distant star dimmed in a spotty manner over time as Saturn passed by. Other graphics in the article would um, get into the research that followed, but first we wanted to present this kind of weird data pattern that captured the scientists' attention. So we presented the data pretty much as is. But as a welcoming gesture to the non-specialist reader, we flagged the take-home message clearly with a title to signal that this data presented scientists with an odd pattern or a mystery to solve. Then we took the jargon out of the labels and added two annotations or small notes tied directly to the chart patterns to help explain clearly what people are looking at without requiring them to bounce back and forth between the caption and the image. Here's a side-by-side -side look. I'm not trying to suggest that the bottom version should replace the top version in all cases. You'll note that we removed some pretty critical information, such as actual flux values, boxed in red, and specificity with regards to time, boxed in orange. But because that top version exists in a paper, I have the freedom of stripping out some of that content, knowing that a source citation will lead a reader that needs to know more to the complete story. Here's another chart that shows an apparent change in brightness of a star as viewed from Earth. Here's the final magazine graphics box rooted in that chart. Here's a closer look at the right-hand side. Jargon has been replaced with plain descriptive language, and a few on-art labels point out the important details directly. The key addition here is the diagram on the left. With this schematic, we've added background information for the non-specialist reader, specifically an indication of why the apparent of brightness of stars often changes and what that sort of pattern usually looks like. Armed with that information, the reader can then see why the pattern on the right is unusual. I'd like to leave you with one final example. <clears throat> 
For an article on gene expression in the brain, we started with a few heat maps provided us to us by the scientist authors. Now this is a pretty intimidating image for the uninitiated, but the original intent for this figure is to communicate results within a peer group. The audience is highly motivated to read and understand that image. And chances are, it builds upon an already familiar shared visual vocabulary within that group. I like to think of it as using visual jargon. Now jargon can be incredibly useful. Words and symbols that carry highly specific information within a specific context can be a really efficient way to communicate with others that are fluent in that language. But it simultaneously acts as a brick wall to outsiders. There are very few, if any, points of entry here for the uninitiated. Scientific American, on the other hand, is not required reading for anyone. So when developing graphics for the magazine, my goal is to knock down the barriers of entry and make the scientific content accessible to a wider audience. Sometimes that content is complicated, like this, and that's okay. The goal isn't to water things down or to oversimplify. The goal is to clarify. <clears throat> to that end, in this case, we didn't reinvent the visualization. Instead, we stripped away the barriers and added welcoming gestures. Here's the final product as it appeared in Scientific American by data designer Jan Willem Tulp. We didn't water down the material brain structure terms remain intact. The full data set remains intact. We simply removed insider conventions, such as the rainbow palette, replacing it with a more intuitive and aesthetically pleasing tonal scale. We included a few brain illustrations to act as locator maps, highlighted a few brain structures in green, such as the cerebellum, and explained how to read the graphic in plain language. In summary, what, why, when, and how are important questions, but don't forget to also ask for whom and allow that answer to also inform the shape and details of your final graphics. Thanks so much. I think we have some time for questions, hopefully answers. <laughs> yes? So um, I would imagine that sometimes when you're working on something for a long time, it's hard to know if the end user is going to get it because you start to just you know, get so into it. Um, do you do any testing of any kind to just, to just check to see if the, the median user is, is getting the message? That's a good question. I don't know if everybody heard. Um, if if uh, we ever do any testing with the graphics to make sure that our intention is actually kind of coming through and working out, um, not not very often at all, sadly, uh, because of the time constraints. Um, I'll often do a gut check, not a gut check, but like I'll, I'll run it by um, a colleague who isn't an area specialist in that particular uh, topic, um, and, and we do that routinely. So all of our text editors. Um, have uh, area specialties. Um, there's more of them. I believe we have about 14 now. Um, whereas the graphics editors were, were generalists. I mean, there's just two of us. And yeah. so our text editors are, have areas of specialty. So I'll be working with like a neuroscience, you know, the, somebody who's, who's very fluent in that um, on, a, on a brain article, for instance. So I might run it by, um, uh, you know, somebody who does more of our chemistry work just to kind of see if, if something's working. Um, there's a little bit of kind of informal testing that happens on websites so we can see how long people stay on a page. If they hit a graphic and bounce, then we know we haven't done our job. If they hit a graphic and they pause for a while and then continue, then we know we've done our job. That kind of data is still sort of, you know, you, there's so many variables involved that we need to kind of just keep collecting it to try to see patterns. Um, but uh, yeah, not as, not as mu the answer is not as much as I would like to just because of time constraints. So, yeah. Yes? A couple of brief, <laughs> brief questions. Uh, how long do you spend on one of these? How long do I spend? Yeah, oh, how many hours? 
Oh, that's trickier than how many days. Um, well, so, yeah, however, days. yeah, right. Uh, so each issue has about seven articles. Um, usually around six of those will have a graphic of some sort. Um, and we work on about six to eight weeks out. From, so we have about six to eight weeks in a production cycle. So I'm juggling a bunch of different projects at the same time and having freelancers work on some of the final art for some of them. Um, so for any, any given piece, like a small chart, like a quarter of a page data visualization where I have a solid single reference, I can knock out in about a half a day, um, but then you need to have some um, uh, feedback loops and whatnot so that you know, you're sending it out to people to review, so that kind of you're waiting then for their response and that kind of thing. Um, for some of the, the more complicated dimensional renderings and things, um, a lot more hours go into those. Um, and those are the ones that I tend to, to be commissioning out so that they can work exclusively on that for several weeks. Um, it's probably not a very satisfying answer. It depends. Right? So one follow-up question. Yeah. If you're doing this on the web mm -hmm. instead of in, in print media, you have the opportunity to have the user uh, basically uh, uh, dig down into the data, in other words, explore. Yeah. Um, you didn't mention any of that. Um, uh, right. How, how do you, or what's your approach to that? Yeah, so for interactive um, pieces, uh, a couple of years ago we experimented a lot more with that than we are right now, to be quite honest. Um, uh, so it, it appears that readers only really want to click around three times in a graphic before they'll bounce out. <laughs> So um, the amount of time that you put into creating a rich interactive that someone can explore for a consumer magazine isn't as, uh, it's, the, the, it's not always worth all of the time you put into it. So we're kind of figuring out that balancing act. We did a few kind of robust interactives. Um, one was a, a solar eclipse. Um, tracker so you could see you know where the next solar uh, total eclipse would be you know for the next you know 100 plus years um, and things like that 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 allow a reader to really say uh, you know to to explore a lot of different variables um, and it's just it's it's becoming clear that people aren't really coming to us to find the answers on their own they're kind of coming to us to, to for us to kind of pre-digest some things and um, provide a story or a or um, kind of a bottom line. People aren't really kind of going down the, the kind of exploratory rabbit hole as much as. Um, I, I, yeah. I was impressed by what the New York Times mm -hmm. put in the edition of the New York Times after the, the election mm -hmm. this past November. That basically gave a data visualization, graphic data visualization, where you could basically go in and zoom in and get yeah. this detailed information, yeah. blah blah blah, and yeah. so on. And the, yeah, no, New York Times are are masters at doing that, and also figuring out when to do it. Now, I think for a while they were doing a lot more of it, but now it's becoming much more strategic. If a person can find themselves in the data chances are they're going to want to find themselves in it and start to dive in. So the minute you start to put geography on something or a personal identity, um, you'll probably get more engagement for somebody because they already they already have some but specific we questions. In Not as science. much, right? Because like, because well, no, yeah. So uh, so for instance, like if we wanted to go do a deep dive interactive on um, you know the the that brain um, piece that that was right, right. Um, you might we might get a few readers that are really interested in diving into that, but not a whole nation that wants to know what's going on politically and dive into you know. So so it's it's a it's a, a kind of figuring out where to put your time and energy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the far back first, and then. Uh, I like your analogy for. Um, uh, your anatomical analogy where you're using the bones first and then adding the flesh. Could you talk more about that process? Because as a scientist, this is something I struggle with, is not going into too much detail right off the bat. How do you stay at the 30,000 foot view and then getting I generally start with pencil, even though I'm like, all, almost everything we produce now is the end product is digital. Because I find um, using a pencil and just scraps of paper um, feels more informal. Um, and gestural, so there's something about 
that tangible kind of thing that sort of taps into a different level. So um, try to keep it gestural and, um, and informal to start, because um, I think once a lot of people start to, well, and, and this is different for people who are used to coding and kind of approaching things from that way, but for me personally, it, the minute I start to get into the computer, I want to start to like kind of create like perfect shapes. Um, and then, then that kind of starts to kick in a different part of, of my brain. So I try to um, just keep it loose and, um, and on scraps of paper and, and whatnot um, at the brainstorming stage. And you know, I try not to get caught up in like, oh, this doesn't look pretty, or if somebody sees this, they're gonna wonder what the heck it is. It's not for anybody else's viewing, it's for my kind of thought process. I mean, it's for the viewing of some of my colleagues, and, but, but they know that it's, um, it's a really rough stage. Um, but I, I definitely recommend like getting getting colored pencils, pencils, and just sort of drawing out thoughts um, to start. Yeah. yeah. I'm wondering to what extent you ever um, get schematics from scientists about what they think is going on here, right? Why does that ever end up being useful, or if it's really mostly? From what you said today, it sounds like it's mostly you doing. Um, no, that's. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't know if you all heard um, how, how often do we actually get the scientist schematics um, and, and instead of like coming up with the ideas ourselves. And, this, and I'm really glad you asked that because I probably am giving you the wrong impression because I'm focusing a lot on projects that, that involve my thought process so I can articulate that full thought process. But we very, almost every time we get, um, when we get uh, manuscripts in, we always ask the scientists give us you know, anything you're comfortable giving us that's related to this in terms of like your, your presentation slides, um, any of your papers, that kind of thing. Um, and then often I'll uh, do a little bit of, uh, of uh, checking things out on my own too because, and like check out their website because it's interesting. I think more often than not, scientists think they know what we need and they give us one thing and really they have something that's perfect <laughs> that they didn't send, so I find it on my own. Um, but. Uh, no, we very often like some. Uh, I should I should have pointed out the uh, the gamma ray bursts, uh, the clouds with the you know which way you know where where's the gamma ray bursts coming from. Um, I asked the author because I you know, they, he gave us some reference material that showed kind of those two things, but not in a really parallel way. So I said, hey, you know, we'd like to do this. Do you think that's possible? And he took color pencils to paper and drew it out in a really beautiful way. So right then we had it, you know, he did basically the concept sketch and the tight sketch in, in one shot. Um, you know, often we'll, uh, we'll rely really heavily on the scientist's work. I should remember to include more of those examples um, when, I'm, when I'm talking to scientists. Um, I tend not to always because I don't know what the thought process was on the first part of it then, but that's a good reminder. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Sheila. Thank you.